Most of us here have stayed in a hotel at some point or another. I, I would say that just about everyone, if not everyone, has stayed in a hotel at one time or, or another. And um, when you have, you probably have looked in the, the drawers of the side tables or the, uh, the, uh, the, the chest of drawers under the television. And you've probably seen something, well, you used to. Now, the young people may not do this. The ACLU does not like these things happening and being distributed anymore. But I don't know if you've ever seen one of these. Now, every, it's like, it's the Bible. No, it's a place by the Gideon's Bible. And many hotels had these Bibles um, in, the, in the desk drawer of the, the, of the nightstand for years and years. And it's harder to find those, actually, if you uh, go to the big cities. You can still find them in, uh, in particular in the hotels uh, south of the Mason-Dixon line in the southeast. They're a little bit more prevalent there. And they're placed by a group called the Gideons. Now, the Gideons, and as if most people have seen these Bibles, I, I would write, you've, you've probably seen them. The Gideons began distributing free Bibles. This is from Wikipedia, which I'm sure the Gideons um, edit themselves. But the Gideons began distributing free Bibles, the endeavor for which it is chiefly known, in 1908, when the first Bibles were placed in the rooms of the Superior Hotel in Superior, Montana. <clears throat> Hotel rooms are the main distribution point for the Gideons. Um, they're now headquartered, they started, I believe, I believe in Wisconsin, actually, and, but they're headquartered in Nashville now. But members of the Gideons International currently distribute over 80 million scriptures or Bibles annually. And the numbers are growing, especially in places like Brazil, India, and Asia. On average, more than two copies of the Bible are distributed per second through Gideons International. In late 2000, or in late April 2015, Gibeons, Gideons distributed their historic two billionth scripture. The distribution of the first one billion Bibles and New Testaments by Gideon members spanned 93 years, 1908 to 2001. The second billion was attained in less than 14 years. So they've distributed more than two billion. And perhaps you have one. Now, maybe I've told this story before, but when I was in grade school, I remember the Gideons came into our school. And, um, you know, we, we, I'd been in the church quite a while. And they, in our, our class usually, our, our grade had like three different classrooms. And I remember going, all of us getting up and going into a different classroom and standing along the wall. And they were handing out the, little, the small little New Testament scriptures. Well, I was of the opinion, you know, I grew up, I was in the church. It's like, you can't listen to anything anyone says. So I didn't take one. <laughs> and my dad said, well, look, the Bible is the Bible. Always take a Bible. Um, but maybe you have one of these, and you've undoubtedly seen one, and you probably thumbed through the first few pages. Now, most of these, and I'll read a couple of things. I won't show it since you probably can't see it. But the first 10 or 12 pages will have um, topics, either types of scriptures or topics you would like to um, have help with, and it gives a suggested scripture. So one is, are you alone? Are you addicted? Are you stressed? Um, and then it's, are you needing hope? Are you needing peace? And it gives a description of, of scriptures you can turn to. Um, and it says, God wants you to know him. Um, and it's your response, and it talks about prayer, the types of right prayer. Um, and then it will... Uh, it says, what does the Bible say about itself? What does the Bible say about God? Um, the judgment, mankind. Uh, but all, this, all of them, not all of them, but many of them are different. Different editions will have different um, themes and so forth in the front cover. So mine doesn't have the, the one thing I was looking for. And by the way, I didn't lift this from a hotel. I bought this. Just so you know, I bought it, $11.49 on Amazon, which is amazing to think about that you can buy um, a Bible so easily and have it at your home in two days. But I asked a friend to send, I knew he had one as well, I asked him to um, photocopy his, the inside of his uh, Bible, and his has a different listing. And again, they have different editions, have different things. 
So and his, it said, if you're discouraged, here are the scriptures. If friends fail you, here are the scriptures. If you are ill or in pain, scriptures, thankful, scriptures, in trouble, weary. And then there's one called leaving home. It's a section called leaving home. Now, some Bibles, as I recall, would say, if you're traveling, if you're traveling. And maybe you know the, the uh, particular psalm that I want to talk about. But there is one psalm that is listed under the heading in his Bible as leaving home, sometimes known as the traveler's psalm. And maybe you know what it is. It's frequently, at least the first verse, is frequently inscribed on headstones. In fact, it's recognized as one of the most loved and popular psalms there is. It's been known, it was been known to have been read by the Scottish explorer from the 1800s, Dr. David Livingston. When he was heading off to his adventure, his journey in Africa, he read Psalm 121 with his family, Dockside. Psalm 121. Let's turn to, to uh, Psalm 121. We'll read that. It's the Traveler's Psalm. As it says in my Bible, the heading of it, the Traveler's Psalm. And let's read that. It says, verse 1, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. So that's often on headstones. Verse 2, my help comes from the eternal who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The eternal is your keeper. The eternal is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The eternal shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul, the eternal shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. It is a beautiful, beautiful psalm. Now, as you might know, Psalm 121 is actually part of a group of psalms known as the Songs of Ascent or the Songs of Degree. Now, these Songs of Ascent, and I'm confident that many of you have heard that term before, are commonly thought to have been sung by the Israelites on their journey to the temple in Jerusalem for the feasts. They would come from all parts of the nation for the feast days. That's the most commonly held belief. Another one is that the, the priests would stand on the steps of one of the buildings in the temple complex as the pilgrims arrived. Now, we all think of the temple as one building, but there's actually a complex of buildings, and some commentaries will say that it would stand on, the, the priest would stand on one of the 15 steps leading up to the women's building. They would sing a psalm on step one, the next psalm on, on the next step, and so forth, as, as the pilgrims arrived. But the most commonly held belief is that the pilgrims were singing these, or as the, as the commentaries say, the pilgrims. Uh, the Israelites would be singing these psalms as they went to the temple for the feasts, different feasts. Now these psalms for the most part are very short, there's one that's a bit longer, and they immediately follow the longest psalm in the Bible, which is Psalm 119. So the songs of ascent are actually Psalms 120 to 134. Now Psalm 121 is, again, where I'll spend a lot of the time today, but I'll read the others too. But Psalm 121, if you think about it, there are different perspectives from which we can read it. Number, number one, there are three different ones that I thought of. There are probably more. But number one, you could read it as a regular traveler. If you're going out on a trip and you're, let's say you're, you're driving to Iowa, you would read it as a regular traveler setting out on a long or a short journey um, perhaps you're a first-year college student starting her freshman year at a school nearly a thousand miles away, 945 actually, or maybe a soldier heading out to a battle in a faraway land, or like Dr. Livingston, on a dangerous journey to a distant place with known dangers. 
That's number one, as a regular traveler. Another perspective could be as we set out on our journey to the feast. Not just our journey, but our experience of the feast. And in this instance, the Feast of Tabernacles or the Fall Holy Days. But again, it's not just the journey, but the feast itself. And thinking of that, and which you can imagine if, if the Israelites actually did sing these psalms, what would we do? What were the meanings there? And how can they apply to us? So that's a second way to, a second perspective and way to look at it. A third is we could look at it as it applies to our spiritual life or our, our journey as a Christian striving to conform to the image of Jesus Christ and God the Father. Well, today, look at the second and third perspectives alternately, uh, touching on most of the Psalms, but just briefly. Let's start with Psalm 20, 121, rather, and we'll look at it from the perspective of our spiritual life and our journey. Again, I'll spend a little bit more time. So the heading on this, on this uh, particular one is God, the help of those who seek him. And I'd like to read through it again really quickly and think about some of the verses in a little bit more context. Again, think of it as you're going to the feast or maybe even in your spiritual life, your journey. Verse 1, where it says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. So many of the Israelites would look to the hills for safety. If there was danger, they would run to the hills. But the temple was also on a mountain. As most of you know, it was on Mount Moriah. And so they could see it in the distance as well. And this Mount Moriah is also believed to be the place where Abraham was prepared to sacrifice Isaac. So it's a really important mountain. But I had a, another way to look at this is that if we look to the hills, we're looking up. Right? It, we can look up toward heaven where God is, keep our eyes up, or elevating our thoughts. I had a friend a number of years ago who actually said it like this. He actually had a couple of nickels on the table. And, you know, I, I was, it was at the feast many years ago, and he was older, but I, I remember how he, he would have these nickels running into each other. And he said, you know, often we're just down here in flat land, and we don't look up. And I remember that. It was a long time ago, but it's true. Another example is when I lived in um, Pasadena for a number of years, um, Pasadena was very close to the San Gabriel Mountains, quite high actually. And you could go up the Angeles Crest Highway, and many of you have, and you could pull off to a certain area at night and you could see all of the lights of greater Los Angeles. It's always interesting, it was so pretty, but it, it would keep your eye down. And I often thought of that, you, can't, you couldn't see the stars. But you can come here, you can go up in the, in the north part of Minnesota, and it's easy to look up. It's easy to look up. So you can see and think more about God. It can elevate our thoughts. So if you, it's about really looking up and not down. And also it shows that the help comes from the mountain of God. His throne is upward. Our thoughts are elevated and it can calm our mind. Verse two, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. That's, that's very similar to a writing in Job, if you remember, when one of Job's friends said, well, where were you when God created everything? God made heaven and earth. He is not confined to time and place. He controls nature. If you think of the miracles, the numerous miracles that God performed, he brought manna from nothing. Manna just rained down from heaven. He can control nature. He's not confined to time and place. God can help us in our lives any and every way. We think of that as our spiritual journey, but we can focus on that, and we will focus on that as we get closer to these fall festivals. Verse 3, he will not allow your foot, your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He'll guard, in other words, he will guard our every step, day and night, He's on watch all the time. He doesn't need sleep. He can be on watch all the time. In fact, Sonsino, the Sonsino commentary, says that the, the sense is that he cannot possibly slumber in, in regard to this task. Verse 4, behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Verse 5, 
and 6. The, the Lord is your keeper, the Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. So it's likened to a refuge, day and night. In other words, all the time. It's not, there's never a time that he's off duty. And it's protection from all things, even the great powers of nature. He controls nature. And you know, there was a, a belief in ancient times that the moon actually called, actually caused lunacy. Makes sense, right? Lunar, lunacy. And so he could protect you from the vast heat, especially in the Middle East, as, uh, as Mr. Erickson was saying, but also from the moon. And, uh, and the, the, the sense is he could protect you from anything all the time. And then in verse 7, the Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. And again, we think of this, that's a, the sense is it's about our spiritual life as well. He can preserve us in every way. And it's, the sense here too is that it's the comprehensiveness of God's protective power. It's almost like a, an umbrella policy. And sometimes in my work I have to get insurance policies from vendors. And you need different kinds of insurance. Well, we need, if you're going to be using intellectual property, we need to make sure that you're covered in case you use the wrong thing. You need um, uh, protection for your workers, um, workers' comp. And then, by the way, just let's have an umbrella policy to cover the things that we haven't thought of. It's almost like that. It's a comprehensiveness. He will preserve us from all evil, including the protection from Satan and his devices. That's at the feast. That's during our spiritual journey as well. I was, um, after the, the service today in St. Cloud, I was talking to the, uh, to the qualms, and you probably know that they've been, they go to lots of different sites, and hurricanes seem to follow them around. You've noticed that. They were saying that when they were in Ireland, uh, probably in 2014, this tremendous gale came right before the feast, and they were staying in a, she, uh, Pam referred to it as a, as a cabin right next to the sea. And she said the windows, she thought they were going to come out. She said, we always are attracted to these great gales or hurricanes. But the real story was when they were in Jamaica, and you might remember this a few years ago, when there was a, a, a fantastic hurricane coming right toward Jamaica, and at the last minute, it swerved far to the, to the, to the west and went around Jamaica. And everyone was amazed. They'd never seen anything that, like that. And some of the weather, weather folks had said, that's not possible. That's not you know, possible with the weather, but obviously it is. He can protect us from anything. Verse 8, the Lord shall pre preserve your going out and your coming in. Again, this is one of the reasons it's, it's really uh, referred to as the traveler's psalm. And from, it said, continues here, from this time forth and even forevermore. We'll notice in many of these psalms, there's, there's that theme of forevermore. And again, very much a theme that we will be focusing on at the, the, the Feast of Trumpets and uh, the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles, the, the, the fact that God will be establishing his government that will last for eternity. It is forevermore. But God watches us every movement, every moment. And we can also focus on the great power and sovereignty of God during the feast, and we understand that he will be there with us. It's a time of worship and reconnection with God. Now, I read some references from um, commentaries here that referred to the Israelites as pilgrims, and that's a, that's a phrase we've heard many times, but pilgrims traveling to the feast. Now, another word for that is sojourner, and that's something we can relate to as well, striving now in our daily lives to live as Jesus Christ would live. We don't fit in. We don't fit in this world. And it's, we're often referred to, and are referred to ourselves as sojourners um, looking to a better homeland. And it reminds us of another person who was a sojourner as well. Let's turn to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. We know this as the faith chapter. And I don't think it was a mistake that Abraham lived his life as he lived it. I think it's an example for us, and we can see the parallels pretty easily, actually. 
Hebrews 11, known as the faith chapter. And if you think of the faith chapter and you think of the Psalm 121 we just read, it very much is about faith that God can protect us and will and will deliver us and will stay with us uh, through our journey to salvation. Um, we have the faith that he can and we have the trust that he will. And I believe those are um, a little bit different. Hebrews 11 verse 8, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out and not knowing where he was going. He was a traveler. He was a sojourner. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents. Does that sound familiar? Dwelling in tents. And again, very much a theme of the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, and Paul and Peter referred to their physical body as tents as well. Remember that? But dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited, and I add, and trusted, for the city which, was, or which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. It's a city that wasn't there when he was sojourning. He was looking forward, again, as we are, as we look to these holy days coming up. Verse 11, by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, he was that old, were born as many as the stars of the sky and multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. And then verse 13, which I think is very much a, a scripture that we read around the fall holy days. These all died in faith. This is about all of the people referenced in this chapter, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth, traveling. We are travelers in many ways, sojourners on the earth, looking toward a new land, a new city that is to come in the future. I think this passage actually has much in common with Psalm 121. But let's go back. Let's go back to the Psalms. We'll go back to, we'll start in verse, uh, or in Psalm 120. We'll go through these. I won't spend a lot of time on each one since there are 15 of them. But Psalm 120, Psalm 120, it really seems to be a prayer for relief from the negative things resulting from living in Satan's world. If we think about this Psalm, you can, when you read it, 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 it really talks about, in some ways, persecution. And, and um, we can see that how celebrating the, the feast would be a relief from this. So we look forward to that. Um, but we'll read it here quickly. In my distress, I cried to the Eternal, and he heard me. And, and deliver my soul, O Eternal, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. Now you could read that and think, oh, that's protect myself. Help me not to, to slander. And it could mean that. But I actually think the sense is here that it's deliver, deliver me from people who are lying about me. Have you had that? Have you had people lie about you? And, and especially in your, if you work at a big company or you, you probably had people who are, are out to get you. They want part of your job, whatever the motive is, it does happen. And I can speak from, from my own experience, fairly recently actually, that that does happen. In verse 3, though, it says, What shall be given to you, or what shall be done to you, you false tongue? Really a sense here that God's punishment to those will correspond to the offense, but we're not to take that action. It shows the protection that God will give us, but also that vengeance is God's, and it will, he will take care of it. In verse 5, Woe is me that I dwell in Meshach, that I dwell among the tents of Kedar. So this is really a sense that you feel like you're living among the heathen. Now, one commentary says the, the tents of Kedar is a reference to the Bedouin. I don't know if that's true, but the sense is, uh, according to Sonsino, is that this is um, the, the, the writer here is living among the heathen. And in verse 6, you're getting weary from that, weary from it. My soul has dwelt too long with one who hates peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. 
always seems to me that the feast and the holy days always come at the right time. Again, just w when we need it the most, that's usually when it happens. And it's an opportunity for us to get away from the influences of the world. We know we're not supposed to be of the world. This describes the world and the, the, the things we face in it, and probably the, the temptation to actually participate in it. But we know we're not supposed to. Let's go to 1 John 2. 1 John 2, verse 15. 1 John 2, verse 15. 1 John 2, verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of, of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it but he who does the will of God abides forever. Again, really just a, 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 a brief synopsis there, a song. It's, and it's listed first. I don't know if they sang that first, but it is a sense that it's a relief from the world, a respite, if you will. Let's go to Psalm 22, or 122, rather. Psalm 122. In verse 1, I won't read all of it here, but I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the eternal. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together. So some of the commentaries really say this is describing a sensation that the, the, the Israelites would have when they walked into the temple, into the temple grounds. They would just feel so much relief and the excitement of being there. It's a moving experience and maybe a sense of satisfaction as well. And we probably feel that way too. If you think about when we, uh, even when we arrive at Trumpets, we're meeting with the local brethren, but it's, it's really nice to, to think of getting together with people who believe as, you, as we believe. But when we go to the feast and we sing with, you know, in the Rapid City, I think we'll have close to 700 people. We sing with a larger group and that first night or the first service we go to, it's exciting. And you can, you can see the brethren and enjoy them. And I like the, the spring holy days for the same reason. If you think of the spring holy days, we spend a lot of time together in a short amount of time. Now, you know, some of us may not like spending that much time with certain of us, but just kidding. But if you think about it, we have, the, we have uh, Passover, and then the next night we have night to be much observed. There's always a Sabbath. A regular Sabbath day in there, the first day and the last day. We spend a lot of time together. It's the same at the feast. Several services, eight days, somewhere probably around 10 to 12 services, depending if you go to all the Bible studies. But it's an opportunity and it's a sense of calm and satisfaction of hearing the, the message and being reinforced of what we really believe and hearing it for several days. Verse 4, where the tribes go up the tribes of the eternal to the testimony of Israel. Now the testimony of Israel, we won't turn there, but Exodus 16 will give a description as, and other places in Exodus, that really this is considered to be the commandments of God and the accompanying items that were in the ark, right? And we think about that at the, we, we especially focus on God's commandments and his ways of life at the feast as well. And we can see the, the reference to giving thanks. Again, another theme of the feast. And verse 6 says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, that they prosper who love you. Again, a, a peace that represents a wholeness and really a no want of anything else, a contentment that we probably feel as we go to the feast. Psalm 123. Psalm 123 is, is really... Um, it's a, a look to God and utter dependence, almost like a servant, but a servant does try to please his or her master. You know, slavery obviously is, we have a fairly recent example in our country, but slavery has been around for millennial, millenniums, it really has. And the one thing that holds true is that the master often 
has power of life and death over the servant. And the servant will look up. And if we take that thought, we look up and we try to emulate God. We want to please him. We want to be like him as a servant here. I think it's a, a really nice visual in this, in this sense. And it says, Behold, uh, un unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of the mistress. In verse 3, Have mercy on us, O eternal. Have mercy on us, for we are exceedingly filled with contempt. And again, often referring here to humiliation um, and contempt for us by those around us. Not all the time, but we do, we do um, suffer that from time to time, and it might exist more than we know. We don't know that maybe our neighbors do speak about us and um, think about, well, why do they go to, why do they dress up every Saturday? Uh, a number of years ago, a, a friend of mine, he has uh, a couple of kids about the age of ours, and he's not, in, uh, he's not in our organization, but he was saying what he felt tough. He grew up in the church as well. He said, you know, it's not just the, he felt bad for his kids. It's not just the, the fact that we, they could get out of school in the fall as soon as school starts and they go to the, to the feast. He goes, it's every Sabbath they miss the, the baseball games that they're on or they're getting into the car in the driveway and they feel like they're being watched. Uh, maybe we feel that way too. Um, and maybe that is in some ways what's the, the, the reference here. Um, and again, just a, just having the, asking in this psalm, asking for the mercy and so that that doesn't affect us and maybe it doesn't really af, uh, apply to us either. But again, very much a, a looking for God's mercy and protection here. Now Psalm 124, 125, and 126 are examples about God's protection of us under dire circumstances, under circumstances that we can't affect. Now, I had a story I was going to tell in this part here. It was a story from the Bible, but I decided to save it because I would have to summarize it so much that I would lose a lot of the details. So uh, since I'm speaking in three weeks, I'll give that one then. But this scripture and these psalms stand enough on their own to think about um, a time when maybe you've, you've actually experienced great odds when there's nothing you or anyone else can do. It's only God that can save us. Only God. Psalm 124, we'll start in verse 1 and 2 here. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Eternal who was on our side, when men rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us alive when their wrath was kindled against us. And you think about the end time, when we focus on trumpets and the feast, we will be called into service, active service, when the world is on the brink of destroying itself. It will be a mess, a real mess that only God can save. And we will be his fellow workers with him there. But it, if you think about that, that's a, a time that is coming. And that also is represented when we're at the feast, holy days is, that, that are coming up as well. But it applies to our spiritual journey here too. In verse 4, we see it's a reference to water. Now, water is really good, right? Water is a blessing. But if you've seen the videos of flash floods that happen in all parts of the world, water can be really destructive. So here it pictures that when it's an overwhelming force that we can't resist. That's the real inference to this particular message, and that's what it will be like at the end time, but it's what it's like in our life from time to time as well. We'll go to Psalm 125, verse 1. Those who trust in the eternal are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the eternal surrounds his people from this time forth and forever. That first verse there, um, those who trust in the eternal are like Mount Zion. You know, you think about that. What, to me, that, that the sense is that those who really, really trust God have an aura about them, a stability. 
um, about them. This summer, I met an older woman um, at the, when I was in England, and we were actually I was staying with Sarah's parents, and they were actually invited to this woman's home for dinner. And afterwards, I was telling Sarah's parents, I couldn't quite say it, I said, there's something about her that is just stable. She seems confident, had a quiet, strong confidence. And I thought of her when I read this verse here. That's really what it was. It was hard to say, but her husband was a longtime minister for many years in not easy parts of the world to live in. And he's, been, um, he's passed away several years ago, but she's strong. And you could sense that. And maybe you know other people like that. I often talk of the older couple that befriended us and really helped us a lot when we lived in Virginia. And um, Mr. and Mrs. Wynn. Now, Mr. Wynn is, is still alive. I saw him last year, last spring. He's in a, a nursing home now. Um, but he's, I think, probably 95. But um, they fasted once a month, like clockwork. And we wanted them, when we needed something, we wanted them to pray for us. They were stable and strong. And that woman really gave that too. And if you think about really trusting God when the odds are against you, this is interesting here. Those who trust in the eternal are like Mount Zion, stable, immovable. That's what we want to be. That's what we focus on in our life. That's what we focus on in these holy days. Um, and it's that conviction and a quiet confidence in God that we've, we've totally yielded to him and we truly trust him. We don't worry, but we learn to fear him and revere him and trust God. And we learn that in our lives. We learn that during these feast days. And again, verse 2 in Psalm 125, it talks about forever. It's a definite theme of the upcoming days that we will celebrate here very quickly. Psalm 126 really seems to be about recollecting a past blessing, thinking about something you got through. I, I remember a few years ago, I think I was talking to Mr. Erickson once, we'd had a, um, our family had had a, a little bit of a tough year. I was like, how is it? I said, well, it was a really difficult year, but it was a really good year. You know, there are good times and there are bad times. He thinks of, you know, I think of that, that phrase, it was a very good year. But we think about coming through a difficult trial. And that's why I think Psalm 124, 25, and 26 really fit together. Some of those things we get through, we look back and it's like, wow, how did we get through that? And yet, look at the blessings we have now. And if you look at um, verse, verse um, 5 and 6, it says, those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his, his, his sheaves with him. I think that's a real look toward overcoming. Overcoming. You know, have you had a, a trial that's been so tough that you sow your sorrow in tears? but it's about overcoming, very much like our lives, that we strive and ultimately you will reap with rejoicing. It says, reap in joy, shall reap in joy. And again, what a theme of the feast that we will um, really uh, celebrate coming up. And it's, it gives you a sense here, um, I know it said it in here, let's see, verse two, it says, then our mouth was filled with laughter if you think of a like a almost a delirious laughter, it's like we live through that. If you get through a really tough gauntlet of a trial, it's you have a, a laughter that comes because it's unexpected, and the, the the laughter from a real joy. So it's a beautiful beautiful psalm there. Now Psalm 127 is really well known to us. In fact, without uh, Mr. Creed playing the piano, we could probably sing this song. Shall we sing this song? No, we won't do that. But Psalm 127, see if you recognize it. Unless the eternal builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the eternal guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. That doesn't mean we shouldn't work or labor, but without the supplement of God, our labor is not worthwhile. Our labor is only viable or worthwhile if God is involved. That that needed supplement from God. 
Now, verse 2, it says, It's vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Now, when I, again, I grew up in the church, so when I was really young, and I don't mean 15 or 16, I mean when I was four or five, because you'll, you'll know why I'm saying that. I thought this meant that God really likes to sleep. It doesn't mean that. It means that you can have a peaceful sleep. Now, in the late 1970s, um, some of you might remember this story, I doubt it, but on the national news program, 60 Minutes, which was a, a lot bigger of a deal at that point, there were only three TV stations plus, as we called it, educational TV. Three stations and, and uh, educational TV. There was a, a program called 60 Minutes. Now, there are six, uh, let's see, there are 120 counties in Kentucky. Um, and one of those counties, obviously I grew up in, Jackson County, was a main story, it was the anchor story on the weekly version of 60 Minutes. And it was all about the corruption of the local elected officials who were stealing the tax money that was coming in. And it was, it was embarrassment, but we knew all these people they were talking about, because, you know, some of them lived three or four miles away. And I remember that one thing that my dad said is that one of the men, one of the men who was over all the, all the roads and everything, he had, he had pilfered apparently quite a bit of money. And the joke was that he looked really bad because he hadn't been getting any sleep. And the further joke was the side of his bed was really flat because he had been sitting up all night on the side of his bed. Have you ever had that? Have you ever had a, a trial, a difficult time and where you worry so much you can't sleep at night, you wake up in the middle of the night. Hopefully you haven't, but restful sleep is a blessing where you don't worry, where you don't have that fear. But, and that is if God is with us and we totally yield to him. Now, all of us have probably tried to force something in our lives and it just wouldn't work. You can think of that. And often we look back on it and we think, we thank God that it didn't work. What if that did work out? What if, what if that is a job I, I wouldn't have, I would have hated that? Or whatever it might be. If we'd have moved to, you know, Florida, for instance. I'm just kidding. Um, that things that we, we look back on, and without God in our life, um, that supplement of God's blessing, then our labor is in vain. I will say one other thing here. Um, this, this is um, Psalm 127 and, and 128 really talk a lot about family. And family is a big part of the feast as well. Now, many of you will be able to, sp to spend time with our spiritual family, but also your physical family. And um, we always want to, you know, when I was, again, not 15 or 16, I was five and six years old, I saw this verse down here. Um, let's see, where is it here? So the next, it's actually the, um, it is actually in Psalm 128. Uh, it says, in the very heart of your house, your children like olive plants all around your table. I hated olives. But I thought, look, if it would mean a blessing for my dad, I'm going to learn to like olives. And I did. <laughs> of course, that's not what it meant. It means, it meant something different. But... Um, if you look at um, the verse, or Psalm 128 and verse 1 to 2, it says, Blessed is everyone who fears the eternal, who walks in his ways. When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy, and it shall, it shall, it shall be well with you. Blessed means happy. In fact, the song, I think, did we sing that, Blessed and Happy is the Man? If we sang that today, that's the first song I learned. Uh, and I remember standing on the chairs in uh, Jekyll Island, Georgia at the feast, singing that song. And again, I wasn't standing in a chair when I was 15 or 16. I was pretty young, but that was the first song we learned. But blessed and happy is the man who fears the eternal. It's a contentment in the life and work, it mentions. That's a blessing. Uh, and real godly contentment is to be found in God's ways. And there are blessings to those who fear God. Now, I do remember uh, spending the feast in, in Jackal Island, Georgia, or my wife likes to point out when I say it really quickly, I say it like we always said it. It wasn't Jekyll Island, it was Jackal. You have to, it was Jackal Island, Georgia. Um, 
and we would spend the feast. Um, the reason we liked it so much is that we would we would uh, rent a home that was right by the right by the beach, and would be filled with all of us, you know. And also, I've, I know I've told you about this older woman who would travel to the feast with us sometimes, Mrs. Addison. And Mrs. Addison had long since retired from being a school teacher. And if she would babysit my sister and me, we did not like that because, but that was the only negative thing. I remember that a lot, but we would live in this wonderful house for eight days and you could go out the kitchen door and through the sand and under some, um, some bushes and you were at the beach and we spent it with our family and the food, even the sandwiches even tasted better at the feast. But it's the family that we get. And if you don't have a physical family that you're going with, it's the spiritual family as well. Psalm 129, Psalm 129 is, again, a reference here to severe trials. And, it's a, it, and the heading here says, a plea from the persecuted. Verse uh, 3, and it says, the plowers plowed on my back. They made their furrows long. Talking about persecution, um, and it could be, a persecution from any number of things. Um, I often, I, I told this story today and people looked at me in surprise because it's not that long ago that people plowed with mules. And I remember as a child um, sitting on the side and watching my grandfather plow with a real plow with a mule. So the, the, the leads, it was one, it would be over his shoulder and he would have it like that, and he could guide the mule like that, but he was plowing. I can imagine what this, this imagery here, they, the plowers plowed on my back, what that would feel like. And Mr. Luganbill um, knows it's just as impressive to see the, the plows that are pulled by tractors. You can imagine the imagery here. But as you're going through this trial, notice verse 4, the eternal is righteous, he has cut in pieces the cords of the wicked. There's no sense of bitterness in this. No sense of bitterness, but it shows a yielded and a converted person with God's spirit does not become that way, but trusts in God. In verse 5, let all those who hate Zion be put to shame and turned back, knowing that God will fight our battles. Now Psalm 130, Psalm 130, starting in verse 1 here, it says, out of the depths I have cried to you, O eternal, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. So we think of the term depths, and often in the Bible that refers to deep waters. And it's a, the symbol of really difficult trials that we may be going through. And it doesn't just have to be persecution from the outside. It could be something we were struggling with, right? So it could be those depths. But an alternate way to look at that, and I think it's an interesting way, and perhaps the way that is not necessarily wrong, but could be right here, is that when you think about we're praying here, it says, out of the depths. You know, there's something that's really deep within us, that's in our being, that there are two people that know us completely, ourselves and God. And if you've ever struggled with something, and we all know that, right? There's always that private place that only you know, and you know that God knows. And so when you pray and think of it this way, out of the depths, maybe the depths of my being, your being, I have cried to you, O Eternal, for help in whatever it may be. Maybe it's, maybe it's a relationship, or it's something you're overcoming, or maybe it's a sense of wanting to take care of your family, whatever it is. It is an alternate way to look at that, that is a, could bring an insight and a special way of viewing this particular psalm. I heard recently someone said that we are the person we try to hide. We are the person we try to hide. We all do. I mean, we all know that there's that sense of us, we not really who we want to be fully and completely, but we know that we want to be a better person. That's really talking about um, our spiritual journey. And it, it's a great theme as well. We, we go to the feast, we want to be rejuvenated and really think about God in his way. Out of the depths, require, we cry to God. Um, verse 5 in uh, Psalm 130 it says, I wait for the eternal, my soul waits, and in his word I do hope. It's a patient and trustful hope. 
And you'll notice here that it goes, let's see, is this the one? Yes, verse 5. It really, it's interesting that it goes from I to my. And that really um, denoting an intenseness in this, as one, as one uh, commentary said, I wait for the eternal, my soul waits. It's almost an added emph emphasis and an intentness that's added here. And verse 6 really conveys a whole complete turning to God. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning. Totally turning to God. Again, that followed by that intenseness in verse 6. And then verse 7, I think, is really something that we think about when we go to the feast with each other. Verse 7. O Israel, hope in the eternal, for with the eternal there is mercy, and with him is abundant redemption. This is really an appeal to our fellow pilgrims, if you will our fellow Christians. And I was uh, thinking the other day, um, and I, it sounds like I'm always thinking about when I was a kid. I wasn't. But I do remember um, spending time at the feast and the holy days with um, families that have long since left the church. And many of the parents of, of, of those kids I went to church with have, have, uh, many have, have long since passed away. But it's brethren from the past who who are gone, no longer in the faith, and I think of their names, I think of the things we did. We used to have, our church, um, we would have, and this will sound very much like it's uh, from the hills of Kentucky, but we would have dances very often, whole church dances. We would have, and we were really good at square dancing, and occasionally we would have, and I thought it was normal, we'd go to my, uh, my cousin's um, garage, he lived way out in the middle of nowhere and people would people would come from Lexington which was an hour and a half away and it would be we would have dances in his garage and you know the 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 square dancing and we think of those people now my cousin and and his family still attend but many of those people quit many many years ago so an appeal here is that all of us have to stick with it it doesn't do any good if we don't run through the tape we have to stay with it and I think that's um, a, a really an, an interesting way to look at that verse. Now, Psalm 131 is really an allusion, I think, to atonement. And think about the day of atonement here. Eternal, my heart is not haughty. It's about uh, humili uh, humility, nor my eyes lofty. It's talking about a, a humble person, a, a spiritually mature person with a calm contentedness. Neither do I concern myself with great matters. We don't have to know everything. We don't have to. Some of it is faith. We don't have to know every little thing, nor with the things too profound for me. Then an interesting um, kind of metaphor here. Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. No longer anxious. You know, when it's time for children to be weaned, sometimes it is a little bit traumatic for the mother and the child. Um, but a real calm that a child that who's, who's weaned is, can still be with his or her mother and be very, very calm and content. And I think that that's, uh, if you think about the Day of Atonement, um, I don't know if you, and Mr., um, Mr. Reynolds was talking about when he was doing a water fast, if you're doing, if, when you fast, I don't know if you have this experience too, at the end of the day, you don't have a lot of energy. And I always think it's interesting too that atonement is before the feast, that we have that right level of humility. And if you're fasting and you're at the end of the day, can you, some, and maybe this is just me, can you sometimes like, if you're sitting there, can you hear your, can you feel your heart beating? Like in your, your ear, you can feel it because you're, you're calm, you're, you haven't eaten and, and it's a, a sense of humility. You're really in touch with, with who you are, but you also know that you need sustenance. You need God. And that happens before the feast. So the Day of Atonement, I believe, is, is mentioned here in verse 3. O Israel, hope in the eternal from this time forth and forever. Psalm 132 is the longest song in the Songs of Ascent. And it has beautiful phrases and it looks to to um, the future very much it talks about the throne of David 
It seems to be written by Solomon. Um, it's kind of looking back. It says, remember your, your um, as it says, remember David and all of his afflictions. It's looking back. And I think, well, if you can look back, you can look forward here too. It talks about the throne of David. It talks about the temple that we know that will ultimately be uh, you and me and all the others God will call and dwell with. It talks about the priesthood being restored, and it talks about the millennial rest in verse 14. Let's start actually in verse 13. For the eternal has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. That's referring, I believe, it's very strong, that God will be dwelling in man. Here I will dwell, it says, for I have desired it. This is my resting place, a very, very much a millennial theme. And in verses 1 to 5 in that, it's all about the glory going to God. It's a beautiful psalm, and it's looking to a time when God will receive the honor and glory from all of his children forever, forever. And Psalm 133, a very, very uh, recognizable psalm, three short verses. And it says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, we've read this many times, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon. As much as a third of the precipitation in Israel comes from the dew. It's a precious thing. And we can see that. Um, at the feast, very much, it's always what people hear about or what we talk about. I, mean, I think in two or three weeks after the feast, we'll have, uh, we'll have where we show photos and we talk about what happened at the feast. One of the things often is that people say, well, we had a real sense of unity. There was not a, a sense of strife and conflict. It was a unified feast. And especially if you go to other uh, sites outside the, the U.S., you, you can sense that. Um, we went to Barbados uh, three or four years ago. I, don't, I didn't like the weather. It was too hot, but we loved the brethren. We still keep in contact on Facebook with some of them. And when you travel around the world and you go to a congregation, we've said this many times, you fit right in. It's the same songs, and you know they believe as you believe. And I think we've been especially blessed in the last few years with a real sense of unity. We'll get that at the feast, and that's what we, we want the, to live for in our lives as well. And then the last one is very fitting. It's thanks being given to God in Psalm 134, very brief. Behold, bless the eternal, all you servants of the eternal, who by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the eternal, the Lord who made heaven and earth bless you from Zion. So there are so many uh, things in these psalms. You can read these uh, leading up to the feast if you want. Uh, coming out of the world is a theme, millennial themes, unity, God's protection, God's great sovereign power. And as we prepare for the feast, we know there are several reasons given for keeping the feast. We're commanded, of course, first of all, we're commanded to rejoice. We're commanded to focus on the temporary nature. If you'll read in Leviticus, it says, remember that the Israelites camped. That shows that it's a temporary thing and we should focus on that. Um, but as we look at these songs of ascent and think of not just the feast days, but our, also our spiritual journey, there, another reason comes to mind. Another reason comes to mind um, about keeping the feast and what we want to focus on. Now, let's turn to Zechariah 14. We often read a couple of verses here. I only want to read the first one in the passage. And we often read the bigger context about what happens to the people who don't come down for the feast. I want to focus just on verse 16 of Zechariah 14. It's our last scripture here. Zechariah 14, verse 16. Zechariah 14, 16, as we close. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king. Worship. It's about worshiping God, to set aside our daily lives, the, the trials, the, the concerns and worry, um, whatever it might be, and we worship the king. We worship God the Father, the Lord of hosts, 
and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles that finishes out here. So as we come to these feast days and we see the parallels to our own pilgrimage and the future world that's coming, let's remember the greatness of our God.